Um, before I start, I'll just acknowledge my co-authors on this, so Simon Goldsworthy is the PI on the project, and then we've got Sarah Lena Reinhold and Frederick Beaulieu as well. Given it's six minute talk, I'm going to fly through this, um, and afterwards there's a talk by Jason from Gina, who's going to pick up some of the things for, relating to fur seals in the quorum, and I'm going to just call them fur seals from now on. So just to give you some background, we have no idea what the pre-colonial population size of long-nosed fur seals in South Australia was, but we know that since uh, from the period that sealing began in Kangaroo Island over the next 30 years, a minimum of 100,000 skins were exported from South Australia. Population numbers re remained low for the next 150 years, and recovery really only began in the 1970s and 80s. We did a statewide survey in 2014, and we put the population size in South Australia to be about 97,000 animals. And the key point of this is that most of South Australia's commercial fisheries were developed in a period of low seal biomass, and that recovery has really happened within living human his, uh, memory. So this has led to a lot of concern from different stakeholder groups on what the effect of these increasing populations are going to have on fisheries, on the environment, on the cost of mitigating interactions. So this work is part of an FRDC funded project to assess the impact of seal populations on the seafood industry. And given I've got six minutes, I'm going to just focus on spatial distribution of fur seals relative to fin fish and aquaculture today, and less so on foraging and consumption effort. So what we knew already from work that Simon and other colleagues had previously done in Sardi, we had a lot of information on what adult male and female uh, fur seals did in terms of foraging distribution and their diet. And the real data gap was surrounding sub-adult and juvenile males, which are the ones that are most likely to interact with fisheries and aquaculture. So to fill this gap, we deployed satellite telemetry devices on 15 fur seals at four locations across the state, Donington Reef, Twitchery Barrage, West Island, and Kingscote. And this was between May and October 2015, and tagged transmission length varied from 756 days. Our first deployments were in May at Donington Reef, and we chose this location, which is the Red Star, because it's a whole out site that's close to key uh, aquaculture leases, which are those blue squares. And what we found was that four of the five animals that we tagged there showed a strong association with aquaculture leases. So you can see this from these two examples. So these are the full tracks of these animals. And as you can see, both of them are moving predominantly from um, the haul out sites, which are either at uh, Donington Reef or at Sibsey, and con continually making return trips to um, these aquaculture lease sites. 90%, 75% of their uh, time, or at least the GPS locations, are from within those sites. And their trip distances on our you know, 10 to 22 kilometers on average, but they never actually left a 20 kilometer radius from where we tagged them. We then did further uh, taggings in July and we tagged four individuals. And again, we saw this association for four, those four individuals with sites up until the point that the uh, tuna pens got harvested and the pontoons got removed. And then this was the change in foraging behavior. So this is two of the three animals whose tags were still transmitting after this change. And what you can see here is the, the green indicates their uh, average trip time when they're associated with aquaculture, blue when they're offshore. So their trip time increased by seven to 12 times greater when they moved to offshore foraging, and their trip distance increased by 10 to 20 times. So why are they associating with aquaculture pens? One of the things we did was we looked at the diet of fur seals that were hauling out of Donington Reef, and Dr. Andrew Oxley at Sardi used next-gen sequencing metabolic coding approach to look at 31 scats that we got there from, oh, two minutes, July 2016. <laughs> Bottom line is, most of the prey they're eating were yellowtail scad, and actually bluefin tuna turned up in less than 2% of sequences. So the real question there is, are aquaculture pens acting as fish aggregation devices, which is certainly the case that has been shown for pelagic species in the med, and we're missing data on pelagic fish assemblages in South Australia around cage aquaculture. In terms of the lower fluoria deployments, Jason will go into the issue there, but we targeted this area because of interactions between um, fur seals and the lakes and corong fishery. This juvenile male, uh, his tag transmitted for 94 days, and in the beginning he spent um, most of his time between West Island and the Corong. but this, followed, um, this was followed by a 38-day trip that ended up 800 kilometers south of where we tagged him. A second individual that we tagged did it in the opposite direction, started off at West Island, went on a 12-day, 325-kilometer trip, then moved into the Korong for five days, at which point the tag stopped transmitting. 
And then this third guy effectively spent all his time in the Korong and hauled out most of the time at West Island. So over a period of 64 days, adding up all his time, the lakes in Korong came to 11.3 days and 4.2 in the estuary. So one of the things, again, we looked at was scats and Sarah Lena Reinhold looked at these from hard part analysis. And what we found from the scats collected in the Korong was that the prey species that were coming up from hard parts were tamar goby, bony herring, and goby species, um, with common carp being uh, contributing the most to the overall biomass. So what does it all mean? I think the really important stuff with this is that using high resolution tracking data when dealing with an animal that's perceived um, to be a problem by some stakeholders, given its uh, recent um, recovery, um, is a really useful way to show the variability in foraging behavior and different associations with anthropogenic activities. It increases our understanding of these interactions and most importantly, it can then be used as a tool in developing, developing mitigation strategies for uh, managers. And the second part of the work that we're um, currently finishing up is then applying all of this data together to build spatial distribution of total consumption of key prey taxa. So we're able to do this for the two uh, seal species we're looking at and then compare what they're taking from the art environment relative to um, the ma main fisheries in South Australia. And Fred Bayou at Sardi is doing that work. And I'd just like to thank all of those who are involved. It's a big project and um, I think that's six minutes. Great, thanks Go Alice. <laughs>